Well, hey everybody. I hadn't expected to see you again until Christmas Eve, but at the special request of Brenda from Mark and Brenda Vlogs, I'm bringing you this special bonus video, and it's the story behind the Carol, the 12 Days of Christmas. And if you'll go to their channel, I'll put a link in the description. Uh, Mark and Brenda are currently, currently doing their own rendition of the 12 days of Christmas and it's quite cute and they're putting up a new verse each day so make sure to go by and check that out. All right let's get to the history and story behind the 12 days of Christmas. For millions the 12 days of Christmas is nothing more than a lovely song. Most link the old Christmas carol with other nonsensical numbers such as grandma got run over by a reindeer or I Saw Mummy Kissing Santa Claus. Yet even though this song seems to make little sense now, there was a time in England when the Twelve Days of Christmas was once one of the most important teaching tools of the Roman Catholic Church. Beginning in the 16th century, British Catholics were forbidden by law to practice their faith. The only legal Christian denomination in the British Empire was the Church of England also known as the Episcopal Church or the Anglican Church in the States and other parts of the world. Those Catholics who spoke or wrote of their faith were arrested and tried under the laws of the time. If their violation was considered severe enough, they were either hung or drawn and quartered. Children as well as adults were subject to the same laws, and age did not prevent the state from dealing harshly with even a young pr practitioner of the faith. In the face of persecution and death, millions refused to abandon their religion. So, much like the early Christians in Rome, Catholics in England went underground. They held secret masses, studied their doctrine behind closed doors, and hid all signs of their faith at home. They were almost a secret society. One of the most severe problems the Catholic underground faced was in teaching their children the doctrine of the church. Since writing down anything dealing with the Catholic faith could cost both writer and reader their lives, messages of doctrine and faith had to be reproduced in secret code. One of the most successful codes ever invented by the Catholic underground during the period was a Christmas carol that on the surface appeared to make no sense at all. Ironically, this rather strange ode became so popular that it found its way into pubs, concert halls, and even the royal palace. Few, certainly not the king or head of the Anglican church, suspected that the meaning behind the song's lyrics included some of the most important elements of doctrine of the outlawed Catholic church. When it first became popular, many in England tried to explain that the meaning of the Twelve Days of Christmas could be found not in the presence, but in the days. There were several theories based on this explanation, ranging from the theory that the verses represented the days leading up to December 25th, to the explanation that the words embraced a gift-giving celebration lasting a dozen days after Christmas Day. During discussions in regard to which days the song referred to, the meaning of the unusual gifts were most often passed off as the fancies of a young man sick with love. The argument be being that the gifts made no real sense, because men in love rarely thought or acted logically. Yet nothing could have been farther from the truth. The gifts were the clue to unlocking the code. The days were a simple mark of the time between Christ's birth and the Epiphany, the time when the wise men came to honor the newly born king. They were nothing more. The secret meaning for Catholic boys and girls was found not in the dozen days, but in the very special gifts. As children sang, they weren't to think of the actual gifts, but of something much different. Every Catholic child was taught that only pure and true love came from God. So from the beginning of the twelve days of Christmas, each singer understood that this song was about a heavenly love, not about a boy's crush on a girl. The importance of Christ's death and resurrection was the anchor to the faith and to the song, and was therefore repeated with each new verse. 
The single partridge in a pear tree represented courage and devotion above what man ever showed on earth. A mother partridge lures enemies away from her defenseless chicks in order to protect them. Just as she sacrifices her own life for her children, so Christ died for us. Add to that image a pear tree that symbolizes the cross, and together this, this first gift represents the ultimate gift given by the babe born on Christmas Day. The second gift, two turtle doves, stood for both the Old and New Testaments of the Bible. Doves were also symbols of truth and peace, once again reinforcing the tie to Christ and Christmas. Today, three French hens mean nothing, but in the 16th century they were a very expensive food item reserved only for the richest homes. If a banquet served French hens, then it was truly a meal fit for a king. In the song, the hens symbolize the expensive gifts brought by the wise men. When the Catholic children sang the third verse of the song, they pictured not chickens, but gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The four calling birds stood for the authors of the Gospels that trumpeted the story of Jesus and told about his life and ministry from birth to death. In a very real sense, the birds' names were Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In keeping with the biblical theme, the five rings stood for the five Old Testament books that the Christians knew as the Law of Moses. The Jews refer to these as the Torah. These gifts were to remind the singer of not only man's fall from grace due to sin, but the fact that a Savior would come to offer salvation and a path back to God. Six geese laying might have seemed comical to those who sang the song without knowledge of the phrase's true meaning, but to underground Catholics the symbolic code was easily understood and incredibly logical. The Lord made the world in six days. Just as eggs are the symbol of new life and creation, so the geese laying eggs presented the whole story of God moving his hand over the void to create life. Seven swans a-swimming would have been a huge mystery to the uninformed as well. Paul's writing in Romans chapter 12 verses 6 to 8 speaks of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. These gifts, prophecy, service, teaching, encouraging, giving, leadership, and mercy, were linked to the lyric symbol of the swans. Birds considered by many to be the most graceful and beautiful fowl in England. Catholic children were thus taught that when you walked with God, the gifts of the Spirit moved in your life as easily as a swan on the water. Eight maids of milking represented the common man whom Christ had come to serve and save. At the time the song was written, no job in England was lower than working with cattle or in a barn. For a female servant to be used in this way indicated she was of little worth to her master. Yet Christ, the King of Man, served people without regard to status, race, sex, or creed. The number eight in this verse also represented the Beatitudes listed in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 to 10. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, the hungry, the merciful, the pure of heart, the peacemaker, and the righteous. In the verse that followed, the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, were hidden by the image of nine ladies dancing. In truth, this dance taught the real joy and rewards of serving Christ. Ten lords a-leaping represented the Ten Commandments. Since the Lord was supposed to be a just and honorable man, and the final voice of law in his domain, it was understandable why ten lords would represent the ten laws God gave his people through Moses. There were twelve disciples, but in the end one of them did not embrace Christ or his message of salvation. The eleven remaining apostles are represented by the eleven pipers piping, thus serving as the image of the eleven apostles who took the message of Christ's life and resurrection and salvation to the world. The final gift, twelve drummers drumming, represented a very important confessional taught to all Catholics. 
called the Apostles' Creed, the confession contained a dozen different elements. The drum was probably used as a symbol of the pace or rhythm that this creed gave each believer's daily walk with the Lord. The Apostles' Creed, familiar even to many non-Catholics, reads, I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. He shall return to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. It is doubtful that the English Catholics who composed and taught this song to their children would have wanted the true meaning of the twelve days of Christmas to be hidden forever. When the practice of Catholicism was no longer a crime in England, those who had created the song probably wished that its mysteries be revealed. They <clears throat> Yet by the time Britain freed the Catholic faith, the words had taken on a life of their own, and no one seemed ready to link the seemingly shallow song with other carols that spoke directly to the birth of the Savior. Even today, 400 years later, though the Twelve Days of Christmas has been recorded hundreds of times and performed hundreds of thousands of times, Few can sing the song without laughing at its unusual message and the lung capacity it takes to get through it. Perhaps the fun that masked its original intent is why the Twelve Days of Christmas has survived for so long, as well as why the Catholic Church survived oppression in merry old England. So there you have the story behind the Twelve Days of Christmas. It actually is a religious song. Uh, doesn't sound like it on the surface, but when you know the meaning behind it, it there's no question about it. All right, I guess after sitting and listening so patiently and behaving yourselves, you deserve a groaner. And today's groaner is brought to you courtesy of Oblix Magnet Fishing and his other channel, Old Hag. I'll put links to those in the description below as well. Well, a gentleman who went into a pub to have his daily beer, and as he sat there sipping his pint, he noticed on the bar a big tin can with a duck on top of it, and the duck was dancing. Well, once he saw this, he couldn't take his eyes off it. He just kept watching this duck dancing around on the tin. And after a bit, the bartender, a publican, came over and said to him, I bet you've never seen anything like that before. And the man says, No, never. That's, that's amazing. And the pub keeper says, Well, how would you like to own him? Oh, I... No way I could afford that, a dancing duck. I mean, that's, you know, that's got to be beyond my pay grade. And the publican says, ah, 50 pounds and he's yours. The guy goes, really? Yep, 50 pounds, he's yours free and clear. Well, the fella digs around in his pocket, comes up with 50 pounds, pays the man, and before the publican changes his mind, he picks up the tin with the dancing duck and heads for the door. And the duck even though the man's holding the tin steady, the duck's still dancing around on it. Just as the man gets to the door, he has a thought, and he turns around to the publican and says, Hey, how do I make him stop dancing? And the bartender, the publican, says, Oh, that's easy. Take the lid off the tin and blow out the candle. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Hans, for that groaner. We all, I'm sure, had a little bit of a chuckle at that one. Well, until Christmas Eve, when I will read you the Christmas story, take care, stay safe, and God bless. Merry Christmas to all of you.